Today we're going to talk about and have an introduction to family history. If you haven't met me, I'm Heidi and I'm the family history librarian and I'm based at Croydon. So let's look at the beginning, genealogy. What actually is it? It's a study of an individual's ancestry and relationships, a list of individuals who are connected, a person in a place at a time, creation of pedigrees with names, dates, and sometimes places, the starting point for family history, the investigation of pedigrees as a branch or knowledge. So, okay, we know what genealogy is, but we also hear the, the term family history used too. Is it the same or are they different? Family sorry, history. Heidi, sorry. Yeah. Um, are we going to get notes that we can download? No, there's no notes for today. No notes, thank you. So family history is a narrative history of the family. It describes the family's activities and how they lived, the places the family in its historical, geographic, social and occupational contexts, Based on a completed genealogy, I don't think there actually is anything like it, a completed genealogy, but as much as we can possibly achieve, and other historical sources. So basically you need genealogy or the research into the family group to be able to write a family history. So why do people do family history? To record a family's history to preserve for all time the history of a family, to verify family stories, to determine if those stories about an ancestor or group of ancestors are true or not. And locate people your parents or grandparents have talked about. Involvement of relatives in a historical event to trace all descendants of a certain person or persons back to the time they arrived in Australia or even before that. Are you planning a family reunion? Wanting to find more out about a certain interesting ancestor and their achievements. Medical or familial traits. So do medical issues pass down through descendants or maybe it's hair colour or just some other physical characteristic. Whatever the reason, the search process is exactly the same. But before you reinvent the wheel, check whether it's been done before. Use Google to look for family trees. You may be surprised at what you find. This may give you the opportunity to get in touch with other family members and other family researchers but also be very wary of information provided. Check for primary and or secondary documents as proof, as it's easily to be led astray with one wrong fact. You also may wish to take out a subscription to a database such as Ancestry, MyHeritage, to find out other researchers to exchange information with. So let's look at the first step. But before we do that, Let's look at a couple of golden rules that we need to obey or should obey to make our life a little bit easier. The first rule is always start with the known and move into the unknown. In family history, this means beginning with yourself and move backwards to previous generations, one generation at a time. The second rule is to prove your work every step of the way. For family historians, this means looking at primary and secondary resources. The third rule is to keep accurate records about the sources and references looked at as the results of your research. So, how to begin. Collect all information about yourself, looking for things in your home that might be useful. Consider sources of information from other family members, 
obtain genuine certificates and they don't have to be certified. You can use historical images as well and other primary documents. Search for official records and put your materials in order. Record keeping. Decide how you wish to record your research, either physically on paper or digitally. If physically, decide how you're going to re record and store what you find. If digitally, investigate the various options such as standalone computer programs or cloud-based online databases. Both have their benefits as well as their problems. Sometimes it might be useful to use a combination of the two. Always have a notebook and pen handy to record what you find. Have a quiet space and time, lots of time. Decide which direction you wish to follow first. It may be one of your oldest living relations or one with an interesting family story, or maybe just one with an uncommon name. Your first step should always be as easy as possible. An unusual name is far easier to extract information from the records as there is vastly more information available than most of us can imagine. Even if you decide to go digital, it can be handy to have some of the following charts with you when you're doing your research to write down what you find and can be added to your digital reference later. Obtain some of these blank charts. Both this one and the next slide are available freely on the Ancestry database, which you've got currently access to free from home during these lockdown periods. Otherwise, just Google. Pedigree and Ancestry charts are used to record your direct ancestors. Create one for your maternal line and one for your paternal line. Other than number one, the top or even numbers always have the male line and on the bottom or the uneven numbers, the female line. And a rule of thumb for all research is always, always, always enter a female's name with their maiden name. And this goes for when you're entering it into your tree or database as well. Because after all, women can get married multiple times and change their names. If you put it in as their maiden name, they're a lot easier to find long-term. Family group records are also very useful because they actually can record quite a lot of information and allow you to put in parents' names and children's names and therefore connect the whole family group together. Gathering records in your family's possessions. These may include, but are not limited to, albums, antiques, awards, baby books, Bibles, birth records, books, certificates, church memorabilia, clothing, computer files, deeds, diaries, diplomas, divorce decrees, engravings, envelopes, ephemera, funeral cards, genealogy done by other people, graduation, handwriting, health centre books, histories, home movies, photos of houses, immigration, initiations, jewellery, journals, land records, letters, marriage records, medals, medical records, membership cards, naturalisation papers, newspaper clippings, notebooks, occupational sources, oral histories, passports, photographs, portraits, postcards, quilts, ration books, references, religious items, ribbons, school publications, school reports, scrapbooks, service clubs, tax records, telegrams, thank you cards, uniforms, evacuate, sorry, vaccination records, voter registration, war memorabilia, wills and yearbooks. And I'm sure you can think of some others. Oral history. So gather your oral family history by talking to your relations. Talk to your parents if they're still around. Where did they grow up? 
ask them about what they know about their parents and grandparents, where they were buried, where they got married. Open-ended questions, who, what, why, when, where, why, how, are the way to go. They're very easy to answer a yes or no question, but that doesn't give you a lot of information. Open-ended questions allow for the expansion on the topic. Visit people, ask to borrow or copy and then return any documents or photos that they may have. Optionally, take a digital camera or, pho or phone and photograph on the spot so that you're not taking that person's items. Don't forget to photograph the person you're interviewing. Who knows, especially with the older generations, how much time we have left. Take documents and photographs yourself. It may be able to jog people's memories and identify people in family group photos that you don't know who they are. Write letters in, and if you are writing letters to the older, using snail mail, especially to the older generations, include a stamped self-addressed envelope and your email address because they may be happy to send something back to you, but don't really or can't afford to pay the postage. Approach your eldest relatives today. Identify people in our old photos, and that can be on social media too. Evaluate family stories. There are often a grain of truth amongst exaggeration. A note of caution though, when talking to relatives and researching your family history, be prepared for what we term unsavory stories or skeletons in the closet. These can include children born outside marriage, adoption, criminal activity, bankruptcy, drugs, bigamy, suicide, and more. You need to consider what you're going to do with this information once you learn it also. Also be prepared for people who won't talk about it. As some of these topics could still be quite sensitive for certain people, and this may include war. There are still so many older people who consider children born outside the marriage a taboo subject, and a lot of the older gentlemen who served during wartime still do not want to talk about the things they saw. So just be prepared for that. Spelling variations. Many people assume that spelling of their name is correct and has remained constant for hundreds of years. This is not always the case. Please keep in mind when doing any research that many of our ancestors were illiterate and often the officials and clerks wrote down what they heard or thought they heard. Dialects and accents can really impact on this. Think about how different an upper-class English accent sounds to that of an Irish accent or a really thick Irish uh, Scottish brogue. It's very easy to confuse words. Also be on the lookout for abbreviations or common names. I've listed a few here, but I'm sure you can think of a lot of others. So for example, Francis could be Fanny, Eleanor, Nell or Ellen, Richard, Rich, Rick, Dick or even Dickon. And John could be Jack. Also the abbreviations, Eliz could be Elizabeth, it also could be Eliza. So just keep that in mind when you are doing your research. Certificates are considered a primary source. Always look at your own birth certificate. From this, you can look up marriages of your parents and therefore in progresses into their birth certificates, their parents' birth certificates, or marriage certificates, and so on and so on. 
you'll notice that different states and country certificates contain different and varying amounts of information. Some have lots and others have the bare minimum. We're spoilt in Victoria. Official registrations began in 1853, but our church records began in 1836. And we tend to keep a fair amount of information on our certificates, unlike other states. So what might you find on a certificate? Mother's maiden name, the ages of both your parents, where they were born, where your parents were married, any other children previously born to that, those parents. And that's just on your birth certificate. But keep in mind, any certificate and the information on it is only as good as the person who provided the information. Some certificates have incorrect information as the informant did not know the correct information or maybe they didn't provide it because they didn't wish it to be known. Some people did like to hide, especially going back a few years. Extracts have a very bare minimum of information, so you'll need to obtain a full certificate. If you choose to purchase a certificate, you'll notice that there's a fair few options. You'll need to buy a historical image. It's cheaper as it does not have the rubber stamp, which you need for legal purposes, but otherwise the information on it is exactly the same. At the moment, Public Records Office of, uh, sorry, no, Birth, Deaths and Marriages Victoria are offering certificates that are digitised for $20 for those historical images. So it's a great time to buy those. Always log in first. Also ask other family members if they've got any certificates which they're willing to share with you. And you can share what you've got back with them. Just to save a few dollars here and there. It all counts. So civil registration versus church records. What is the difference? Civil registration is the certificates we use today, birth, death and marriage. They list dates, places, names, parents, etc. Most countries of the Western world, civil registration began around about the 1837 mark. Church records are those huge books that are held by the church and they list very minimal information usually only dates, names, and sometimes a father's name. Most churches had three books, one for birth, one for marriages, and one for deaths. Many churches did continue to use these books even after civil registration, just to keep a list of who was born, married, or died associated with their church. Both are considered primary resources. So where else can we go to find records? The library website. If you go to the green arrow, it shows you the search function on our main page, which links directly to our catalog. We have thousands and thousands of books that might help you or help direct your research. The red arrows show you how to access the family history page on our website. We have a couple of international databases, such as Ancestry and Find My Past, which you've got free access to with your library membership, and also a huge number of links directing you to a wide variety of other locations and sources of information. To do this, run your mouse over the word services, and that'll bring up a box of options. Click on Family History to access the information. And these are our databases. So I've got access to Ancestry and also Find My Past. At the moment, due to COVID, both are available to you through the website from home. But normally you do need to come into the library and access those on either your device or one of ours. And I heard this morning that Find My Past has extended its home access and that's a great thing for all of us. So these are the links I was talking about. The 
internet is a fabulous resource for family history research, but not everything is online. And that's a golden rule also. So check out what actually we have in the library's website. Below are the links of the library website. We've put together in subject folders to make searching a bit easier. Click on the topic that you're wanting access to. And there's a huge number with each in each topic. Many of these website links are free to use, but some of them do require you to sign up and others may charge for access to their information. If you're coming across any of these links, which are not working, let either myself or Charles know so we can get them fixed or replaced with something that is. Other information or primary sources which you may want to investigate. Wills, these can give valuable information regarding family relationships and whereabouts. Often the children are listed. The daughters may be called by their married names. Their spouse is also named. Or if the deceased was not married, then other family name members may be named, especially nieces or nephews of spinsters. Inquests. An inquest was held or is held when cause of death is unknown or occurred in suspicious circumstances. Always useful from time to time to have a look at those. Land titles and rate books. They can show where land was leased or purchased, gradual improvements have occurred or struggles to pay the rent or rates. All of these can be found in state archives in Victoria that's the Public Records Office or PROV. Where else might we look to find out where our ancestors lived? Post office directories, rate books, trove digitised newspapers, obituaries, headstones, electoral rolls, and also naturalisation indexes through the National Archives. Immigration and passenger records. These date the arrivals into the colonies. Maybe that may be determined from a death certificate, which then you look at the indexes in the state archives or using the microfiche here in the library to find the shipping records. These will show you the date of arrival, who they traveled with, and possibly the age and occupation of the immigrant. Sometimes other information is also listed, such as native place, whether they're illiterate, where they're contracted to work when they arrive, how much they're going to be paid. But this depended on how much information the ship's captain wrote into his travel logs. Sometimes not even names were listed, just the number of people squeezed onto the ship, especially those traveling as steerage passengers. Everyone immigrating into Australia from 1923, you will find those records at the National Archives, as are naturalisation indexes. Military records. The nominal roles for World War I and II are held by the National Archives also. They also hold most service records for those who served in World War I have been digitised and many from World War II. But not all. There's always going to be some exceptions due to the classification of the work people did during World War Time. The DVA, or Department of Veteran Affairs, has pr recently produced nominal roles for more recent wars such as Vietnam, Gulf, etc. But most of those are still protected by privacy laws and can be only accessed by the service people themselves. Other resources. Keep widening your area of research. Visit the Public Records Office or other state archives. Obtain wills, probates, land records, hospital admission, asylum records and court proceedings. Consider joining a society such as Family History Connections or the Genealogical Society of Victoria. Visit the State Library. Aside from their genealogy centre with lots of resources, they have a vast newspaper collection, maps, manuscripts, diaries, and pictures. 
Family Search has a large range of documents, including many from pre-civil registration, covering many, many areas all around the world. Trove newspaper digitisation has many of Australia's gazettes and newspapers, both major and small, up to 1954. The National Library also has a huge range of books, maps, archives, and historical documents. Also check out the historical societies and churches and museums in the area your ancestors lived. They have an incredible collections and most of it will not be online and not found anywhere else. Correspond with cousins and other distant relatives. Many older family members may have old letters and or photos that they're willing to share that may be otherwise lost when they pass on. Ask for an email address as this is the most cost and time effective method of communication and can be accessed anywhere in the world. Really great when you're here and they're somewhere overseas. But if you're using snail mail, as many of our older family may not use computers or email, always include that self-addressed envelope and offer to pay for any photocopying. Visiting ancestral areas. Research the local history of the area your family was in. Look at local maps, including historical ones, and compare them to modern ones. Look at the internet. What is there now? What was there then? Become familiar with place names. The name may have changed over time. For example, Port Ferry. It was once called Belfast. And Bendigo used to be Sandhurst Town prior to the gold rush there. Travel to the area. Visit local libraries, historical societies, churches and museums. After all, family and local history are linked and you can't have one without the other. Organise a family reunion. This could be organised around a significant date, such as the arrival of an ancestor in Australia or the marriage of pioneer ancestors. Who to include? All descendants of that person or couple? All related families? All passengers on a ship that arrived? Descendants of settlers to a certain area? The choice is yours. You may wish to prefer to preface this with regular family newsletters or in more modern times, a closed family Facebook page. This is a great way to get acquainted, share photos and documents and build the family tree with correct names and dates. The tree could be displayed at the reunion. It may also include a visit to a place or places of significance to that person or persons that you're all descended from. And don't forget to gather information from those at the reunion, including stories and anecdotes, and add these into your family history afterwards. No matter what you plan or where your research leads, the most important thing is to stay organised. File letters and photos, even if they don't seem connected yet, they may well be. If using technology to record your information, think about using a database or an online tree. Weigh up which works for you better and which is most cost effective. No matter what you choose, make sure you have a GEDCOM capability to enable sharing and migration. Always back up your research to an external hard drive. If storing physical documents and photos, look at acid-free archival boxes to preserve them. And ultimately, get organised, stay organised. It will save you hours of work. Any questions? Um, a question, is that the ancestry that's available on the library website, does that include America? Yes, it does. Oh, cool, because I it's... have ancestry, the but I don't have access to America, so I can, I, I it's will It's the library that. version. Yes. So it does have access to America, India, Canada, um, some South Africa, et cetera, that the world access does. 
but there are limitations on it as well because I'm it's sure the I'll library version. Yeah, yeah. All right. So okay. whatever you can use in the library is what you've got access to it from home at the moment through the website. Thank you very much. And you, you referred to uh, microfiche at the library. Yep. Is that is, um, is a list of the uh, those microfiche resources available? Not yet. I'm still working on that one. Right. Okay. Um, so, if, but if you come when we are allowed, if you come into the library, uh, you will be able to explain or show me what is available Absolutely. there. And particularly, the, I'm a bit interested in the immigration. Yeah. The biggest collection is here at Croydon. Right. Um, Charles has a collection at Roville. There's also a collection at Knox, Yarra Junction, and when Belgrave reopens, there'll be a collection there as well. Right. Okay. Thank you. But the biggest one is here at Croydon. Um, I'm in the process of getting that microfiche holdings up to date. But as I'm sure you can appreciate, it's a massive task. And COVID restricting our movements has caused a few problems with that. And uh, we've got other tasks to do instead of focusing on family history, unfortunately. Unfortunately. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Where can you get the acid-free boxes, Heidi? Um, Office works have them um, and other photo shops will also sell them because they're preserving um, photos as well. Um, but just do a Google search because I'm sure you can find some around. I'm not sure what the boxes IKEA sell um, are. I think Kmart also have some acid-free boxes also, but just in case, so just do a Google search and see what's out there. So is it therefore safe just to have the photos within them? They don't need to have any, um, any sheets of anything in between them? Not necessarily, no. Um, if you're gonna put anything in them, just use um, some acid-free paper. Um, I believe, that most photocopy paper these days is acid free, um, but definitely not plastic. Any other questions? Um, Heidi, why do you say definitely not plastic? Plastic will deteriorate documents over time and especially photos, it fades them, um, especially if they were printed on a heat sensitive paper. So for example, you've got a photo of an ultrasound, you know, when most people have got a printout of when they got pregnant and there's their little baby, they're printed on a thermal paper. You put plastic against that and you've lost that photo. Right. Thank you. So always keep the plastic away because there's quite a lot of chemicals in plastic which will deteriorate all your documents. You got anything to add, Charles? No, that sounds all right to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, storage is always a problem because there's so many different formats. Um, acid-free folders, acid-free uh, boxes, they're obviously the way to go. And, and the general sort of things about keeping them flat, not handling them, um, not allowing too many people to touch them. And if you have to annotate a photograph, do it in pencil on the back. Yep, absolutely. And if you want to share it, Take a copy of it, so take a photo of it and share the photo of that photo. Just make sure you, when you're taking the photo, you get a photo of it in its best light, which is natural light. And try and, to... And, yeah, and of course, a general thing with any document, certificate, photograph is ideally take a digital photograph so that you've uploaded it onto the cloud somewhere so that should the worst happen to the original, you've still got an image of it. Absolutely. And that, from my point of view, um, is the benefit of, benefit of using a variety of methods of storing your information. So personally, I have an ancestry tree and I don't necessarily advocate that that's the best method. That's what works for me. I also have family tree maker 
which is a digital program on a standalone computer. Um, I also have thousands upon thousands of pages of written information, which I haven't digitized and uploaded onto either the cloud, um, but they are digitized and stored on an external hard drive, which is kept at a different site to my computer. So that if I lose, as Charles said, something desperate happens like a fire or a flood, I've lost my laptop, I've still got that digital backup, which lives at my in-laws place. Um, you know, somebody breaks in to your house, they steal the laptop. If that's the only place your digital is, even if you've backed it up onto that laptop, you've still lost it. So it's always good to have an external source of that backup. And that can include the, the GEDCOM file of your tree. Um, because if you just keep it in one place, it, it can be lost. Or, as I've discovered recently, corrupted. Yeah, if I can just add to that, I, I mean, yes, obviously the internet and computer files have uh, revolutionised family history, but I'm still a believer in paper because paper doesn't get corrupted, doesn't go offline, doesn't go down, doesn't have companies uh, close, uh, don't have computers fail, as you say. So mm. I, I'm a great believer in keeping a paper bag up as well. Yeah. That both Charles and I are still available for one-on-one -on -one help if you want to get very specific in your researching needs um, and need help. And we can still do those during lockdown as a Microsoft, Microsoft team session if you're or interested even just as a well. Telephone or an email. That's right. Mm. So, you know, you've got some options if you need help. We're here to help you. It's great. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for all attending today, and I hope you enjoyed it and got something yeah. out of it.